In 1989, residents of a close-knit apartment community in Virginia gathered for a holiday celebration. For Tammy Brannan and five-year-old daughter Melissa, Christmas was always a special time. Then, without warning, the little girl was gone. Her disappearance ignited an impassioned search. Law enforcement and the local community spared no effort. But would they piece together the evidence and find her before it was too late? In 1989, in front of close to 200 witnesses, a child disappeared. Five-year-old Melissa Brennan vanished from a Christmas party at her mother's apartment complex in Virginia. Children have a way of wandering off, but it soon became clear this was more than a case of a lost child. Someone had taken Melissa. What sorrow compares to a mother's grief? What kind of monster preys on children? I'm Jim Kallstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. The hunt for Melissa galvanized the community as a nation held its breath and waited for word. All victims deserve justice. All criminals must be punished. But when a crime involves a child, the stakes become so much greater. On December 3rd, 1989, the Woodside apartment complex in Lorton, Virginia, held its Yuletide Christmas party. The Woodside was a large but friendly complex, a community that revolved around family life and children's activities. The kids were always excited about the party, which meant special treats and presents. A single mom, Tammy Brannan, had found in the Woodside Complex a safe community in which to raise her only child, Melissa. As the evening wound down, Tammy stopped to visit with a friend before going home. Can I go get some potato chips? Okay, we'll come right back. Okay. She lost sight of her daughter for only a few seconds. But that was long enough for our mother's worst nightmare to begin. disappeared. The Fairfax County, Virginia Police Department was called immediately. I'm going to do everything I can to find your little girl, but you have to tell me everything you can possibly Detective Bill Wilden assured Tammy they would do all they could to find her little girl. The detectives began questioning the people at the party. No one could recall seeing Melissa leave the party or anywhere near the front door. I'm Detective Wilden. This is Rappaport with the Richard Rappaport, the Fairfax Department Search Commander, joined Detective Wilden to organize the search party. If you come across anything suspicious, an article he would head up the investigation. Does everyone understand? One of the possibilities, of course, there. was that she had just uh, hidden somewhere in the building, was playing with some friends, or had wandered off. So immediately the patrol officers on the scene did a very good job of searching the building and they began a search of the immediate area surrounding the building. The night of December 3rd was a bitterly cold night in the Washington area. Uh, someone outside that was five years old without a lot of protection probably would not have survived uh, through the night. It was that cold. 
outside with flashlights. Rappaport coordinated a more specific grid search of the area with patrol officers and dozens of volunteers from the complex. The search effort began. Nearly a hundred neighbors, police, and army personnel from nearby Fort Belvoir combed the woods around the complex. Most were parents themselves, united by a single concern, to find Melissa. Like the detectives, they expected to find a shivering and frightened little girl lost in the dark woods and crying for her mother. Officers began to question the 200 people who had attended the party and interview over 400 other Woodside residents. Though the complex was large, many residents knew Melissa and knew her to be very shy. Shocked to hear that she had disappeared, almost all expressed doubt that she would ever have gone off without her mother and certainly not with a stranger. Detective Wilden went with Tammy to her apartment to interview her. He questioned her extensively about her past and possible troubles with her neighbors or employer. An accountant, she had never had any problems with anyone. Tammy had lived at Woodside for over three years since her divorce from her husband in Texas. She had experienced the normal readjustments of a newly single mom but she and her ex-husband were on good terms. When detectives discovered an open window in the furnace room, Nobody Jim Gogan, the crime scene investigator for the Fairfax County Police Department, was asked to examine it. The way the door was set up, everybody had to either go through the crowd to get out the front of the building. Um, that was the, only, the main door and the only door available to get out, uh, with the exception of the, the hallway down to the bathrooms and the furnace room, they had large, uh, large windows. And in, in the furnace room itself had a, a, a window, what was discovered open. And from there, the assumption was made that possibly that's how she uh, was taken from the building. Melissa's disappearance was suddenly far more complicated. The search for a missing child had become a possible abduction case. Did you see her leave the party at any time? The police continued their questioning with even greater urgency and began to hear repeated mention of the strange, even bizarre behavior of the maintenance man for the complex. Several of the women reported how offended they were by extremely vulgar sexual propositions made to them by Caleb Hughes. There was a possibility that if she had been abducted for sexual purposes that she might be molested, but we were very, very um, hopeful that we could at least find her alive uh, before her life was in jeopardy. Now that they were dealing with a possible abduction case, detectives returned to Tammy's apartment and collected nightgowns, hairbrushes, and bedclothes, any items bearing traces of Melissa. Can you describe As detectives continued questioning the people at the party, they learned more disturbing details about Hugh's behavior that night. He had spent what seemed to many to be an unusual amount of time playing games with the children. He made the parents uneasy by touching the kids. There was something unsettling, something indecent about him. At the party, he was not dressed. Uh, uh, as well as the rest of the people, he wore his work clothes. Um, he mingled with some of the people he knew at the party, and he spent some time talking with Melissa's mother, uh, making comments about Melissa, and offered to take Melissa and a couple of the other children to the restroom if they needed to go. He just had some very suspicious behavior from a man of his age around the children. With growing suspicion, the detectives tried repeatedly to reach Hughes by phone and then went to his house, but were told by his wife that she had no idea where he might be. Were you playing with her tonight? He had left the party sometime before our arrival there. He lived only four miles away, but it took us several hours for us to contact him because he had not yet returned home. Finally, two and a half hours after Melissa's disappearance, 
Caleb Hughes called the police, who then returned to his house. Upon questioning, he claimed he had simply taken the long way home. The officers immediately noticed he was wearing different clothing from that reported by witnesses at the party. I washed clothes tonight when I got home. They're in, they're in the washing machine over there. In the washing machine, they found the clothes Hughes had been wearing, as well as his sneakers and a leather belt with a knife sheath. The knife was missing. You washed your shoes at 2 a.m. in the morning? Yeah. He'd been gone for several hours, and to come home in the middle of the night when your family was asleep, and to feel the immediate need to wash everything you had been wearing, including your shoes, we found that rather suspicious behavior, and that just further added to our our interest in, in his whereabouts. As Hughes appeared reluctant to speak in front of his wife, the officers decided to take him to headquarters for further questioning. Suspecting that Hughes might be covering for time spent with a girlfriend, the officers wanted to allow him the opportunity to tell the real story. Do you know Melissa Brandon? No, I do not. To the detective's surprise, there was no real story. Hughes had no alibi. He claimed he had no idea who Judge. Melissa was, that he had driven the long way home Why were you washing your after shoes? picking up a six-pack, and then had simply washed his clothes. You normally wash your shoes with your clothes? Sometimes, yeah. What were they dirty with? He said as an excuse that, that were, they were his only work clothes and he had to be to work the next day and they were dirty, so he needed to clean them for work. Look, am I being charged with anything? Despite hours of intense questioning, Hughes remained no, smug and evasive. I'm free to go. Finally, yeah, Detective to go. Wilden told him he was free to go, I know you're though he was almost certain Hughes was lying. Well, you're going to have to prove it then, aren't you? As far as the Fairfax County Police Department was concerned, Caleb Hughes was the prime suspect. Believing Caleb Hughes was involved in Melissa's disappearance, Detective Bill Wilden contacted Fairfax County Commonwealth Attorney Robert Horan. It was a suspected homicide, certainly by then. He made some statements that, that were out of character for somebody who really yeah, is Brandon? a suspect in a uh, crime yeah. of this nature. You would we normally think the, the minute somebody would suggest you or I have a, a abducted a five-year-old child, Look, I mean, you would think we, it would be the most vigorous, vehement outburst. Of course I didn't. Well, they got nothing like that. Matter of fact, at one point he said to, uh, he said to Wilden, prove it, which is, uh, again, a, an unusual reaction for somebody who had nothing to do with it. Gogan had photocopied Melissa's picture and printed hundreds of flyers to help in the search. And as the sun came up, the, the search expanded um, into you know, further down south on the highway. Um, they sent soldiers out to do a, a massive searches through the woods, along the railroad tracks, and, and as possible ideas of, of locations where she might have been were developed. Again, um, hundreds of people were, were uh, gathered to search and walk those areas. The car Hughes had been driving that night belonged to his wife. She gave investigators permission to impound and search it. Detectives examined it for fingerprints, blood, fibers, hair, any evidence that would document Melissa's presence there. Fingerprint tests revealed that only the Hughes family had left prints on the car. Next, all the hairs and fibers needed to be collected from the interior. This type of trace evidence was usually retrieved with a vacuum cleaner, but there was simply too much debris inside. When I first approached the car and looked inside, I, I just kind of went, whoa. Uh, they had two large dogs, the Hughes, um, they carried them a lot in that car. They were, it was just cluttered with dirt and debris and, and just just a mess inside that car. And, and I just kind of shook my head like this was gonna be a, a real challenge. So I decided to, uh, to, to use the masking tape 
as an alternative to the vacuum cleaner, just hoping to uh, just get what was on the surface. That was an unusual technique, certainly. Um, in, in my years, that was the first time I ever had run into it uh, in the Fairfax uh, Police Department. And uh, it's, it's a very common technique now. Gogan then placed the tape between layers of clear plastic so that it could be examined intact under a microscope. As the car processing continued, Melissa's disappearance quickly became the lead news story in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Melissa Brannon is three feet tall, 48 pounds with blue eyes and dark blonde, shoulder-length hair. She was last seen wearing a pink ski jacket, red plaid skirt, and black shoes with gold buckles. The night of the party, Melissa had been wearing a navy blue acrylic sweater with a Sesame Street Big Bird picture, red tights, a red cotton plaid skirt, and a pink parka. Uh, when I found the red and blue fibers that were visible on the tape, I, I did kind of get uh, excited about that. But at the time, I was excited but worried because we needed to find her to, to identify uh, the clothes, the possible clothes. Without Melissa, that was going to be real tough. When Gogan conducted luminol testing on the interior of Hughes's car, he found traces of blood on the steering wheel, brake pedal, and floor mat. When a light is shined on the luminol-treated area, blood stains will appear fluorescent. While the luminol process is quite accurate as a blood locator, it can also destroy the genetic characteristics of the sample. When I sprayed the steering wheel, I got the reaction on the steering wheel and as well as on the, on the pedals of the vehicle, that's where the, it, it fell to. Um, these items were swabbed and, and collected. Hughes's shoes had been washed but the lab was able to identify possible blood stains on their soles where fresh cuts had been made. It became very suspicious when I received the clothes from the, the officers who searched the house and noticed that he had uh, cut his tennis shoes. Um, kind, of, kind of putting two and two together that why was he cutting his tennis shoes and why did I get a reaction to blood on the gas bottles? Surely Caleb Hughes had tried to cover his tracks to avoid a link to an unimaginable crime. What is your name? Caleb Hughes. How old are you? With the luminol findings showing right. blood in his car, the detectives were increasingly confident they could get a confession from Hughes. He was brought in for a polygraph test. He had no explanations for the fresh cuts on his shoes. No. Once again, he gave no explanation for the two hour, 30 minute delay in getting home. But as it turned out, there never was an explanation. He said, I just took the long way home. That was the best they got. Did you harm Melissa Brandon? No. Did you kill Melissa Brandon? No. He's a proven to be deceptive. When Hughes denied outright that he had killed Melissa, Polygraph examiner Rick Danielle was sure he was lying. He really denied ever having seen this child, denied knowing who the child was. He was showing pictures of her, never seen that child before. And of course, the police knew that was not true because he had been at the same table with the child, had talked to the child. You got the wrong guy. I'm asking about what you did. You got the wrong guy. Danielle was absolutely satisfied he was hiding something, that uh, he was lying about something. I'm out of here. He was attempting to deceive him. But of course, none of that under Virginia law, uh, as you may know, no, that's evidence. Uh, you're not allowed to use it at trial. Investigators were convinced Hughes had abducted and harmed the beautiful little girl. But Tammy Brennan tried to keep her hope alive, fighting her worst fears. Melissa's Christmas presents waited under the tree. News 7 has confirmed tonight that the investigation into the disappearance of five-year-old Melissa Brennan appears to be focusing on one primary suspect. Police will continue their search efforts and to pursue leads. There is now a $10,000 reward for any information concerning Melissa's whereabouts. For Tammy Brennan and her parents, the hours passed in an agonizing wait for more information.
Melissa's disappearance electrified the tiny rural community of Lorton, a suburb of Washington, D.C. Only five months earlier, 10-year-old Rosie Gordon had been bike riding in her neighborhood when she was abducted, raped, and murdered. Her killer had never been found. Rosie's mother quickly came to Tammy Brennan's support. The yellow ribbons that punctuate trees and balconies at the Woodside apartment complex in Lorton have weathered Once Melissa's disappearance was reported on the news, the community rushed to her support. Yellow ribbons began appearing on Christmas trees throughout the area. Uh, by all indications, Tammy was a wonderful mother, a very loving mother, very, very protective of her child. Melissa was her only child, and I, I just think all those facts together struck a chord that virtually anyone could identify with those circumstances, and, and people's hearts went out to the, to the Brannon family. Hundreds of people volunteered to post flyers throughout the region and assist the local authorities in their search. A new expert was also brought into the search effort. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children sent John Goad, one of their search and rescue consultants. And we are uh, legislated into being as the state clearinghouse for all the information regarding missing persons. And we also assist families and law enforcement, kind of as a liaison between the two, uh, working as many cases as we can. After debriefing, Goad and his partner went directly to the apartment complex clubhouse. Check his stride out here. Outside, they found adult male footprints leading from the furnace room window to a split rail fence whose top rail had recently been broken. We began to find transferences on the other side of the fence into a small parking lot there beside the clubhouse uh, in the parking lot, I think it was an abandoned restaurant or some type of building there. And that's where the track stopped. Straight through here, over this fence. Right from the beginning, we found the adult footprints, but we never found the child's footprints. So we felt comfortable that if that was the abductor we were looking for, and we felt pretty comfortable that it was, that Melissa was probably being carried even from out, outside the window, was being carried by the abductor to the point where she, she and the abductor got in the vehicle. But no, where would Hughes have taken her? I don't know. Detectives received a lucky break when they interviewed the Hughes's wife. To come in. She had been somewhat suspicious that he might go somewhere else after work. She didn't want him to go anywhere except to work and directly back home. And so unbeknownst to him, she had made a note of what the mileage was. And the following day told us that she had checked the mileage again and that 12 miles had been put on the car. We now had a p another piece of possible information about the extent to which okay, he could have gone that hours? night. We first marked the location of the crime. This was the apartment complex in southern Fairfax County. We next located Caleb Hughes's residence, which was in northern Prince William County, roughly in this area. We then took a string that was the equivalent of 12 linear miles and tied the two ends of the string together and placed them over the pins. So we simply took a pencil and defined that area so that any point at the end of that string represented the outer limits of the search that was conducted on December the 8th. Within three days of Melissa Brannon's disappearance, investigators had organized a 25 square mile joint search with the Army, Police Department, Civil Air Patrol, and Coast Guard. Over 500 volunteers turned out for the effort. We have a 12 mile radius that we need to cover. We had dozens of search teams that were comprised of trained law enforcement people, civilian volunteers, and military personnel. They were doing step-by-step -step searches of defined areas. Each area had been broken down and was assigned to a team. We're going to be looking for the clothing a lot. That's going to be one of the main things. They had specific instructions on how to search. If they found anything which they thought might be evidence, they were to mark it, uh, not to disturb it. And we had teams of crime scene people who would then respond to that particular location and process the evidence. At this point, we've not found anything today 
that puts us any closer than we were this morning. The volunteers were frustrated and extremely disappointed. I know there were nights when I would go home and my family would have seen a newscast about another day of searching and my own children would say, Daddy, are you, are you going to find that little girl? When are you going to find that little girl? And, and I think that was a conversation that was occurring in the homes of dozens of investigators and police officers involved in this case. While the search continued, Gogan approached the nearby FBI lab with the evidence he had processed from the car. Because Melissa was still missing, the FBI's state-of-the-art technology would be critical in establishing the connection between the hair, fibers, and bloodstains collected and uh, Melissa Brennan. Agent Doug Diedrich of the FBI's Trace Evidence Unit would examine the evidence. Perhaps he could find a link to Melissa Brannan. There you have to go to extraordinary measures to try to recreate, if at all possible, the environment of the victim, the most recent environment, and also the types of hairs that the victim may have, the type of clothing that the victim may have, uh, may have been wearing the night of the disappearance. And that's, that's a difficult part. As long as Melissa was still missing, filing charges against Caleb Hughes was all but impossible unless compelling evidence could be found. Diedrich and the lab examiners were impressed by the large number of fibers that had transferred onto the passenger seat of Hughes's car. Fairfax County investigators had identified nearly 70 different fibers. That included the, the blue acrylic fibers, the red cotton fibers, the black rabbit hairs, and, and there were, uh, I believe, uh, one or two head hairs in the case. But that's monumental. Sounds like a small number. That's huge. Once the FBI entered the case, its agents conducted their own investigation of Hughes's house. When Caleb Hughes's name was released as the primary and only suspect in the case, a media frenzy followed. Hughes has not been charged in the case, but he is the target of round-the-clock surveillance by the FBI. Federal investigators working with police from Fairfax County last night executed a search warrant on the groundskeeper's rented townhouse. They recovered several items which have been taken to the FBI laboratory to be tested to see if there is any evidence linking this man to Melissa. In the meantime, the FBI's official comment is no comment. The FBI brought the power of a federal grand jury to the investigation. The grand jury ordered Hughes to submit to blood and other forensic tests, something the local authorities had not been able to order. Hughes complained bitterly in interviews that his life had been ruined by the invasion. Details of a troubled past emerged. Hughes grew up in an abusive, dysfunctional home. He had a record as a juvenile delinquent, a long history of drug and alcohol abuse, and a disturbing attraction toward children. As an adult, he had been convicted of larceny. He had been convicted of car theft. Um, he had been convicted of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. The evidence indicated that he did spend a, uh, a lot of time with young children, nobody the age of, of Melissa Brannon, but certainly a, a, a lot of children in their early teens. In the lab, FBI examiners had begun analyzing the stains on the soles of Hughes's shoes. Though luminol testing had damaged the samples taken from Hughes's car, they became increasingly convinced that these minute traces contained blood serum proteins that could determine the crucial connection to Melissa. This blood's been... This, it, the samples were submitted for DNA and serology tests. Fifteen days after Melissa's abduction, a candlelight vigil for Melissa was held at the apartment complex. The little girl's disappearance had united the Fairfax community in compassion and outrage.
And during that whole Christmas season of 1989, that every night on the 6 o'clock news, she saw uh, the video shot that her grandfather had taken of, of Melissa Brannon. And uh, I'm, I'm sure I was like many, many people in the metropolitan area of Washington who felt that they knew her from, from seeing this lovely child every night on television. But shortly after New Year's, a judge in the next county received a letter from Hughes's probation officer informing him that Hughes had violated probation for an auto theft conviction two years earlier. On January 24th, the judge revoked Hughes's probation and he was finally put behind bars. The earliest he could be released was November, giving the Fairfax County prosecutor ample time to build his case. Without sufficient evidence to file charges, Hughes had remained free. But now, with Hughes safely put away, the FBI had the time needed for the extensive testing required by the trace evidence. There was still a chance Melissa's body might be found, but without it, the case against Hughes would have to be made in the FBI lab. Already, FBI examiner Doug Diedrich had found his first big break in the case. I remembered some black animal hairs in the debris from the front seats of the car. And in looking through the little girl's nightshirt, I noticed these similar black hairs sticking out of, out of the nightshirt. So it just rang a bell. I went back, mounted those up on slides and compared them, and sure enough, dyed rabbit hair and they matched each other. The rabbit hairs from Hughes's car and those found on Melissa's nightgown both revealed a distinctive corncob texturing, an exact microscopic match. Agent Diedrich immediately called the prosecutor to determine whether Tammy Brannon owned a rabbit fur coat. Not only was it confirmed that Tammy Brannon owned a rabbit fur coat, she had worn it to the Christmas party. Her mother had bought it in Germany, and it was dyed an extremely rare bluish-black color almost unknown in the United States. Melissa had handled the coat at the party and at home. Diedrich had made the crucial connection between Melissa and the car of Caleb Hughes. So you not only, you tied those rabbit hairs, you tied that match, not only to the fur coat of her mother, Peanuts. We can have you peanuts tied it to the front seat of the car, but you also tied it to the child's environment itself, uh, the rabbit hairs on the, on the shirt of the child. To me, I, that was a significant point in the case, because then it starts pushing me in the direction of, we might have something. And, and from there, it was a matter of digging some more, to see if I couldn't find some additional fibers that may be of value. So I started digging a little bit more, starting looking a little closer, asking questions of myself, asking questions of the evidence, because it's speaking. Strange, but it's speaking to me. As week after week passed, Melissa's name eventually disappeared from the news. Life in Fairfax County had returned to normal, but Tammy Brennan was still no closer to finding her child. All right, all right. It's tremendously difficult for the family to come to terms with everything that that has gone on to come to terms with, with still trying to hold on to that glimmer of hope that their child's alive, and then the realization that in all likelihood, you know, they may never find their child alive or may never find the body of their child, even after they've been murdered. Tammy was forced to face the reality that by now, there was almost no chance Melissa could still be alive. How'd you do it? We wanted to close this case and, and not just close the case in the sense of identifying and prosecuting a suspect, but we wanted to bring real closure to the case in answering the question, what happened to Melissa Brennan that night? Why did it happen? Such questions plagued Tammy Brennan. Depressed and unable to work, she remained secluded in her apartment, waiting. Agent Diedrich had examined the blue acrylic and red cotton fibers in the passenger seat evidence collected by Jim Gogan. At first glance, they appeared to match descriptions he had been given of the red tights and Big Bird sweater Melissa wore that night. 
But without a duplicate outfit to make an exact fiber comparison, he was at a dead end. And so I went home, spoke to my wife. Of course, she straightened me out right away that if it had a big bird on it, it wasn't Winnie the Pooh and it had to be sold to J.C. Penney's, having young kids of my own about the same age. Diedrich asked his wife if she kept any old J.C. Penney catalogs in the house from the last few years. She said she knew she had a Christmas catalog. He's me about being a pack rat. I think it Diedrich was astonished to find a picture of an outfit that exactly matched the description of that worn by Melissa. The FBI contacted J.C. Penney, and the store began a search of its records. For more than two months, Tammy Branham had anxiously waited by the phone for some kind of information or word about her daughter. Where is she? Then, completely unexpectedly, she received a phone call. A man's voice told her he was holding okay? Melissa for ransom and that she must deliver $75,000 the next day or her little girl would be seriously hurt. Can I talk to her? Had Melissa been found? The national statistics will tell you that a child who's abducted by a stranger is usually dead within three hours of the abduction. So the likelihood of Melissa being alive months after the abduction is extremely slim. Mom? They have Melissa. Tammy immediately called her mother, but Detective Wilden cautioned them not to let their hopes get too high. No, no, don't, don't call anyone. I'll tell you all about it. Just come over right now. Once again. Melissa Brannan was okay. about to become front page news. Detective Wilden had instructed Tammy Brannan to cooperate with the ransom demands in the hopes her daughter would be recovered alive. As extortion falls under federal guidelines, the FBI coordinated the ransom drop. The FBI SWAT team was ready when two young men showed up in the parking lot to pick up the money. I see him getting ready to open up the door. We got the bag. Go. Here we go. FBI, FBI, freeze! They were quickly arrested. But did they have Melissa in their possession? The information provided in the ransom call was so vague and so generalized, it's entirely possible that the, the, the person who called <clears throat> may have picked up that information simply by watching the news or reading the newspaper. Uh, usually if there's a ransom demand that is legitimate, they're going to have very specific information that would be known only to the abductor and probably some of the investigators. The two arrested youths were former students and roommates from a nearby university who had seen an opportunity to make some easy money out of Tammy Brennan's tragedy. They were convicted of five counts, including conspiracy and extortion, in the United States District Court in Alexandria, Virginia. It turned out to be just a terrible hoax. I mean, just terrible. The, the, the notion that you would do that deliberately. Uh, to the uh, a mother who was going through what she was going through. There were copious amounts of dog hairs in the tape samples collected by Fairfax County crime scene investigator Jim Gogan, as well as dozens of human hairs. FBI lab examiners separated and painstakingly subjected each one to testing. Finally, a hair was found that was different from the others. The hair was a very light blonde, the only one of its type found in the vehicle. But it was an exact match with the hairs found in Melissa's hairbrush. Matching the human hair with Melissa was the second big match for Diedrich. But the critical link of Melissa's clothes to the fibers from Hughes's car was incomplete without a duplicate big bird outfit to analyze. Because it had been a special Christmas outfit, produced only once, it could not be found in stock. J.C. Penney gave the FBI a list of people who had purchased the outfit from its catalog division. They then sent FBI agents out across the country to locate those people 
and determine if they still had the Big Bird outfit that they had bought from the J.C. Penney catalog, and ultimately they were able to locate a sample outfit from a, a family that still had the outfit. Obtaining the outfit could mean the difference between conviction and acquittal in the case. The FBI asked the family traced through the J.C. Penney records to send it to their crime lab. Well, I remember that day pretty clearly. I, I knew the outfit was coming in. The fiber color, according to the color in the catalog, was navy blue. But the fibers that I was finding were sort of purplish blue. So I was a little anxious that maybe this wasn't the same outfit, that maybe we were going the wrong direction. So when that package came, I was, again, I, un, un, you know, uncomfortable with even opening it because I, was, I, w I thought I was on the right track, but I didn't. I didn't want to be wrong. Open up the box and sure enough it had a purplish coloration to it so it, it kind of gave me a nice warm fuzzy feeling there that I might have the right color anyway. Fibers were pulled from the red cotton skirt and the blue acrylic sweater. A thorough analysis of the fibers from the outfit indicated an identical match with the fibers from Hughes's car. From the red cotton threads to the blue acrylic yarns to the yellow cross threads from the plaid skirt, the duplicate Big Bird outfit matched in every respect with the car fibers. What I was finding was meaningful evidence that an abduction had taken place, that in fact the victim uh, in all likelihood had been in the front seat of the subject's car. With the new evidence, the prosecution could now piece together the actions of Caleb Hughes on the night Melissa disappeared. At the party, Hughes had tried to pick up several adult women, but when they rejected him, he sought a substitute. Fueled by frustration and alcohol, Caleb Hughes became a desperate predator with a perverse desire. His stalking eye fell upon the children. He waited and watched until an opportunity presented itself. When it did, Caleb Hughes seized an innocent and trusting child. Hey, Melissa. Hey, remember me? By abducting Melissa Brennan, Hughes had crossed the boundary into the unspeakable. We had to like The analysis of the duplicate Big Bird outfit produced compelling evidence. It would be a powerful tool in the case against a man who investigators felt was a ruthless child molester and murderer. But Agent Diedrich had to convince the jury how incredibly unlikely it would be that these fibers had come from any source other than Melissa's outfit. He began asking people at the FBI to give him any items they may have made of navy blue acrylic. He collected more than a hundred. And the ob objective was to see, do the fibers that I found in the front seat of Cal Hughes' car, do they match any of these? The answer was no. From the items, Diedrich collected 126 different acrylic fibers. He made 7,983 comparison tests with those fibers against the ones found in Hughes's car. Out of almost 8,000 tests, only one succeeded in making an exact microscopic match with the blue acrylic fibers found in Hughes's car. And that was the duplicate Big Bird outfit. Whenever you match two things, it has a lot of significance. These aren't random events. These, in most cases, occur. Is it possible? You can't deny the possibility that it could be a coincidence. But after looking at this stuff for a lot of years, 
I'm not a big believer in coincidence. Three weeks before the trial was scheduled to begin, as investigators made final preparations for the case, a stunning development occurred. They received a phone call. Two counties away, police had just found the body of a child on the median strip of Interstate 95. I'll be right there. I called Wilden. We got in his car, and there was absolutely no doubt in my mind that um, that that's, that was going to be it, because Hughes uh, knew that area, spent time down in that area. I said, "Wow, this this is going to be it." That section of median on I-95 is wide and densely wooded. It would have been easy for Hughes to pull over, hide the body among the thick vegetation, and drive off unnoticed, and there would be little chance of someone finding the remains. But someone found a body. Was it Melissa's? If it was Melissa Brannon's body in the highway median, Fairfax County Commonwealth Attorney Robert Horan felt he could put Hughes behind bars on murder one charges. His hopes were high, but they were soon dashed. As soon as we got there, as soon as I saw it, I knew it wasn't Melissa Brannon. It could, the skeleton had rings on three fingers, uh, but it was a young girl. She's um, 13, 12, 13, 14 year old, um, who had been in that media for two growing seasons. The young girl's body was never identified. Finally, nearly one year after Melissa's disappearance, Hughes was arrested on a grand jury indictment for abducting Melissa Brannan. He was transferred from the Prince William County Jail to the Fairfax County Jail. Moran had delayed the indictment for several months in the hope that Melissa's body would be found. By then, um, I know we were all pretty satisfied that the worst had happened to the child. Uh, unfortunately, under Virginia law, uh, you can charge somebody with murder uh, without the body, but you have to be able to prove where the murder occurred. And of course, without the body in this case, um, we had no way of proving where it occurred, so we couldn't charge him with murder. Abduction with intent to defile was the strongest case that could be brought against him. Hughes pleaded not guilty. Few people in Fairfax County believe that Melissa could still be alive, but everyone, most of all Tammy Brannon, needed to know what had happened and needed to see justice served. Because it's tremendously important that the family of that child had definitive answers, that they know what happened to their child, even if the news is not pleasant. They need to understand exactly with concrete information what happened to their child. They need to be able to have a closure. They need to be able to, to give that child the burial that they deserve and go on with their lives. With Agent Diedrich's airtight analysis of the trace evidence, Robert Horan went into the trial confident that he could convince the jury beyond reasonable doubt. The trial began on February 26, 1991. A chief part of Horan's strategy is depicting Hughes' deviant sexual behavior at the party. He produced several female witnesses who recalled the crude, vulgar sexual propositions he had made to them and others who testified he had spent considerable time playing with Melissa and had been talking to her just before she disappeared. His behavior was even more extreme, trying to eliminate the evidence. Washing his clothes, his leather belt, his shoes. He could not account for the fresh cuts on the soles of his shoes nor could he account for his whereabouts for the two and a half hours between leaving the party and arriving home. But the problem for the defense is somehow you had to explain that time, and, and, and there was never an explanation. I mean, he would have gutted our case. Our case is over if you can explain any of that time. 
Though tests for blood on the shoes had proved inconclusive, the prosecution was now able to show the jury the exact matches made between the rabbit hairs, the head hair, and the fibers found in Hughes' car. Nonetheless, the defense argued that all of the fiber and hair evidence was purely circumstantial. It may be circumstantial, but it is powerful circumstantial evidence because it doesn't change. In order to obtain the maximum sentence for Hughes, Moran needed to convince the jury that Hughes had intended to defile Melissa once he had her in his car. And the only way the fibers from her outfit would have been found on the seat is that her, car, her coat had been removed while she was in that car. The prosecution charged that Hughes could only have removed Melissa's coat for one purpose, an attempt to defile. The true answer is that that five-year-old was seated against her will in the front seat of that vehicle. Caleb Hughes's trial lasted eight days. After nine hours of deliberation, the jury found him guilty of abducting Melissa Brannan with intent to defile. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison. For the family members, it can't end because of the eternal hope, if you will, that someday this child that's never been seen, never been found, this child someday will, will appear. And that's, that's hard stuff. That is hard stuff. Caleb Hughes is still serving his sentence today, and the body of Melissa Brannan has never been found. Eventually, Tammy Brannan moved from a Woodside apartment complex, but she never changed the telephone number that Melissa had memorized by heart, hoping that one day a call might come. The day began like any other for Cheryl and Paul Chapman until the silence of a peaceful Sunday morning was shattered with a phone call. Cheryl's sister Nancy had not shown up for work and several attempts to reach her by phone were unsuccessful. The Chapmans, sensing something must be wrong, Nancy? rushed to her apartment. Some killers are stealthy, killing with an almost clinical precision. Others act on a violent impulse, saturating the crime scene with their rage. How a murderer behaves tells much about who he is. In 1987, the brutality of a triple homicide in Anchorage tested the mettle of even the most seasoned investigators. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. When Nancy Newman and her two young daughters were found slain in their apartment, local law enforcement needed help. They called the FBI. At the crime scene, clues were everywhere, but seemed to lead nowhere. Agents knew that to crack this case, they need to somehow get inside the killer's mind. Alaska sits on the edge of the wilderness seemingly isolated from the rest of the world and its troubles. Its inhabitants are united by the beauty of the landscape and a mutual respect for the self-reliant nature of the community. On the rocky coast of northern France, where the Atlantic Ocean crashes ashore, the villagers of Kai wake up each It was shortly before 8 a.m. on a Sunday, March 15, 1987, Cheryl and Paul Chapman were awakened by a phone call. No. Cheryl's sister, Nancy Newman, was hours late for the breakfast shift at the restaurant where she worked. Nancy's shift manager told Cheryl that Nancy's car was in the restaurant parking lot, but Nancy was nowhere in sight. 
Maybe the chaplain should check on her. From the moment Paul and Cheryl arrived at Nancy's apartment, they sensed something was wrong. There was no sign of Nancy. Her two daughters, eight-year-old Melissa and three-year-old Angie, were nowhere in sight. Coffee mugs from Cheryl's Friday night visit with her sister were still in the sink. The remains of breakfast had been left on the table. The tin where Nancy kept her tip money sat empty. And a brown cigarette butt, not a brand Nancy smoked, was in the ashtray. Nancy? Nancy? In Nancy's bedroom, Paul made a gruesome discovery. He found Nancy lying beaten and lifeless on her bed. Paul rushed to the other bedrooms to find Nancy's two girls. To his horror, he found Melissa and Angie brutally murdered. Within minutes, the first Anchorage police officers arrived at the Newman's apartment. Not wanting to disturb the crime scene, the officers secured the area and tried to calm the distraught family until the crime scene processing unit arrived. found was horrific. Nancy and Melissa Newman appeared to have been beaten and strangled. Little Angie Newman's throat was cut so deeply she was almost decapitated. Anchorage police officer Bill Gifford was at the scene. Well, the impact of a case like this is uh, well, quite often it's hard to capture in words. We're pretty used to working uh, homicide cases and serious assault cases. And overall, I think a community becomes, uh, oh, if not callous, somewhat accustomed to these kind of things happening, just the uh, a typical murder. Something of this magnitude, however, people are never prepared for. The murders were so gruesome that even experienced police officers were shaken. It uh, is shocking for the for the public, and it takes a toll on its uh, on the investigators and the officers working the case as well, because you're uh, just not used to seeing, uh, as I mentioned, things of this magnitude. Nancy Newman's body was lying on her bed, her nightgown hiked up around her chest. There were abrasions on her nose, chin, and forehead, and a knee seemed to be injured. Blood stains were at the foot of the bed. A pair of olive green gloves were on top of the dresser. Good idea, Yeah, do a scrape so then get some. Where are 
Down the hall, Melissa Newman was found on her back in the middle of her room. A bloody, twisted pillowcase under her neck. Another pillowcase had been used to tie her arms. Three-year-old Angie Newman lay on her bedroom floor in a pool of blood, surrounded by her favorite books. Couple shots, couple shots of the face. The bed where all the blood is. Everybody's ready here. Bloodstain pattern analysis often yields clues. The positions of the victims and killer the movements of the victims, and the number of blows struck can be reconstructed by an experienced examiner. In this particular case, it assisted us in uh, establishing a sequence of events. Stains found on Nancy Newman's bed suggested that she and Melissa had been forced down the hall to her mother's room, where they were assaulted and stains on the hallway carpeting indicated that Melissa was then returned to her room and killed there. Officers treated each area as a completely separate crime scene. First, they determined the type of physical evidence that was likely to be found, and then the order it should be processed. How are we doing? Given the horrific nature of this crime and the lack of an obvious suspect, investigators knew that every possible piece of physical evidence was potentially invaluable. Detective Sergeant Michael Grimes was in charge of the Anchorage Police Department's Homicide, Assault and Robbery Unit. I knew that they were going to be in this crime scene for hours and hours and hours. Uh, this immediately is what we, we identify as a forensic case. There was very little disturbed uh, by them when they found the bodies, so we were very fortunate in that respect. Investigators frequently find evidence in common household dirt. Sometimes hair and fibers buried in carpeting can be traced to a suspect. For thorough coverage, investigators broke each room into quadrants and vacuumed each section. To begin the painstaking task, investigators must first cordon off a three foot by four foot area of the room. The investigator uses an ordinary vacuum with a special filter attachment. As the debris is pulled off the floor, it travels down a short tube and then goes into a collection point. There, it becomes trapped in clean filter paper. Once a quadrant of the room has been processed, the filter is removed and placed into an evidence container. Many minute hairs and fibers are missed by crime scene vacuumings, Therefore, a portable argon laser is used, which causes unseen hairs and fibers to fluoresce when exposed to the laser's light. A technique called luminol processing was also used to look for traces of blood. If present, the luminol spray will cause the proteins in the blood to fluoresce, making them visible to examiners. Yeah. Shot him. We were processing the, the scene and looking for invisible traces or invisible blood patterns. And we found a luminescent impression that we were able to photograph. We also knew we had a, a knife missing out of the kitchen. We took one of those knives out of the knife set and we found that matched uh, in width and length to the uh, to that of the uh, of the luminol impression that we had. The crime scene appearance suggested the murderer had taken the victims by surprise. It appeared that Newman's morning routine was suddenly interrupted, perhaps indicating that they knew the killer. Okay, excellent. Good job. A big question was motive. 
At the scene, Cheryl told police that Nancy seemed to have no enemies. As a waitress, she was popular among her customers and colleagues, friendly without being flirtatious. And what possible motive could explain the rage inflicted upon eight-year-old Melissa and three-year-old Angie? Burglary was unlikely. It was obvious to investigators that the apartment had not been ransacked or otherwise disturbed. Investigators struggled to find a solid lead. I Detective Bill Reeder worked the case from the beginning. The initial lead uh, came from the scene itself that we could find no signs of forced entry. So that kind of leaned us toward looking at people that had access to the apartment or knew the, knew the victims. Immediately the questioning began. Neighbors, family and friends, anyone who may have had information. What we were looking at was to find someone that had seen anything unusual, uh, any strangers in the area had heard anything unusual, had seen someone carrying things away, uh, anything at all that would help us uh, focus on, on someone or somebody. Family members are almost always suspects early in an investigation. Paul Chapman was no exception. Though he had no one to back up his alibi, which was that he was alone most of Saturday, his reaction to discovering the bodies was clearly one of Trump and us. Investigators spoke with everyone close to the family and learned that Nancy Newman was happily married to John Newman, the father of their two girls. He was a suspect, spouses usually are. But John Newman was in California training to be a locksmith at the time of the murders. Another way to eliminate a suspect is to watch and continue to talk to him. Uh, John never gave us any indication other than he wanted this case solved. Uh, he was extremely distraught. Gave all the signs that anybody would give under the circumstances. Because the Newmans lived in a multi-unit apartment complex, Detective Grimes knew that interviewing neighbors in the immediate area would be a daunting task. It was an apartment in a multi-unit apartment house, which was in a particular area of town that was surrounded by large multi-unit uh, apartment houses uh, and we were looking at literally hundreds of, of dwellings in that area. The close-knit community of Anchorage was shocked by the brutality of the murders. Police investigators having no experience with crimes this shocking were asking the most frightening of all possible questions. Was a serial killer a possibility? Police felt pressure to work quickly. For what kind of person would do this kind of crime? Uh, was there significance in the way the people were murdered uh, that could give us some kind of leads as to who we were looking for, at least what type of person? And uh, so immediately, I'd say within the first day or so, we were getting some help from the FBI. Investigators quickly realized they needed help in determining the type of individual responsible for the murders. They turned to the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit at Quantico, Virginia. Special Agent Judd Ray received the call. As a profiler in the unit, Ray's job was to assist investigators in hunting down America's worst killers. To do that, Ray had to understand the workings of a killer's mind. We were looking at deeds and acts of individuals after it happened and trying to predict the kind of personality, if you will, a composite view of what kind of human being could have done it. Through detailed evaluations of crime scene photos and police reports, Ray provided investigators with a psychological portrait of the killer. 
This is a disorganized uh, crime scene. I mean, you know, low self-esteem, all the kind of things that you would say about uh, about this kind of person. You know, that uh, he's been, uh, he's uh, <clears throat> society has rejected him through the years, and now it's his time to reject society. Ray told the Anchorage detectives that they possibly faced a repeat performance. This particular incident alarmed him so much, particularly with uh, you know three victims at one time, two being children, uh, that his opinion also, he said that uh, you know we need to get something working on this right away because uh, it appears that this person's out of control and there's the potential that uh, uh, he's going to be doing it again in the very near future. From the autopsy reports, investigators learned that Nancy and eight-year-old Melissa Newman had been sexually assaulted. Based on this information and characteristics of the crime, Ray concluded that this violent offender would have a history of sexual assault. He would be a white male in his early to mid-twenties, an underachiever. Following Ray's conclusions, investigators began to narrow the range of possible suspects. Among them was a young man who had recently moved in a few doors down from the Newmans. Police also questioned Kirby Anthony, the 23-year-old nephew of John Newman. Anthony had an alibi into the morning hours of Saturday, March 14th, but the neighbor did not. The tremendous uh, rage that was inflicted uh, on the almost decapitated the. Uh, the young three-year-old suggested that they, to me, that 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 that, that, that there's nothing uh, in my mind that I had uh, came across that would uh, have been sufficient on its face to justify this kind of rage by a stranger. Ray's insistence that the killer was known to the victims led investigators to shift focus away from the man who lived nearby. Neighbors and friends of the Newmans confirmed the young man's claim that he had never met Nancy Newman or her children. Because I had talked about familiarity, somebody that's close to the family, somebody that knows her, that had some sort of relationship with her, perhaps even been rejected by her. Uh, they said, well, as a matter of fact, there's a nephew that comes to mind. As investigators continued questioning possible suspects, the volume of evidence that had been collected from the crime scene was taxing the limits of Alaska's state crime lab. Once again, Anchorage police turned to the FBI. The evidence was sent to the FBI's crime lab in Washington, D.C. Hair and fiber expert Doug Diedrich was given the case. Diedrich began by sorting through the evidence, searching for any link to a suspect. Hairs, fibers, glass particles, soil, paint chips, anything that may have been transferred during the killer's violent contact with his victims. Uh, altogether, I believe I looked at th over 300 close to 400 items of evidence from the crime scene, from the victims, from elimination samples from different people, both suspect and relatives and possible acquaintances. Fibers are unusually difficult to trace. And because no one knew what the killer was wearing during the murders, there was no basis in which to compare recovered fibers. The varieties that are out there are endless. So that when an individual in a case, for instance, who is wearing a particular type of clothing uh, transfers fiber material, that evidence will, will be considered to be unique. Even though they may have made a number of garments of the same type, by the time it gets out into the public, this material is dispersed like a drop of oil in the ocean. It just, it's there, but it's hard to find. Distinct fibers, amounting to less than a thimble full of evidence, were recovered from throughout the Newman's apartment. Diedrich's expertise of fiber transfer, however, enabled him to reconstruct the suspect's movements during the crime, giving investigators a clearer picture of what actually transpired in the apartment.
As Diedrich's analysis progressed, Anchorage police asked Kirby Anthony to come to the police department to give more detailed statements. They began to learn more of his story. And Rose? Anthony and his girlfriend had moved from Twin Falls, Idaho to Anchorage 18 months earlier. Both had stayed at the Newmans for a while, but were asked to leave about the time they found jobs on a fishing boat. He and his girlfriend split up while working on the boat after Kirby accused her of having an affair with the skipper. His mates described him as irrational and unstable after the breakup. He clashed with the skipper and was fired. He returned to Anchorage alone on February 14, 1987. Having nowhere else to go, Anthony took a taxi from the airport straight to the New Orleans. Through Cheryl Chapman's continued assistance, Police learned that John Newman was upset over his nephew's return to the Newman household during his absence. At the same time, the situation was becoming increasingly uncomfortable for Nancy. After a few weeks, she asked Anthony to leave. He moved in with an acquaintance, Dan Grant. As the investigation began to focus on Kirby Anthony, Sergeant Grimes recalled his first encounter with him. The day of the murders, Detective Grimes took on the task of notifying Anthony about the deaths. I told him that uh, we had some bad news for him, that uh, his aunt and, uh, and her two little girls had been found dead just earlier that morning. Uh, as I recall, Curly, Kirby uh, grabbed his hair and and started wailing and, and moaning, uh, but it was all dry-eyed, there was no tears. Anthony's demeanor did not fit that of a grieving family member, but Grimes knew that Anthony's odd behavior would never justify an arrest. The autopsy report, however, made investigators more suspicious. Autopsy results helped pinpoint the murders between 7 a.m. and noon on Saturday, March 14th. What we were able to, to demonstrate is that the murders happened early in the morning, after the victims had, had uh, gotten up in the morning. The, uh, one of the victims had had a bowl of cereal, the other was in the process of eating some cereal. The mother was in the process of having a cup of coffee. Establishing the time of the deaths made Anthony's alibi irrelevant, which was that he was at an all-night party until early that Saturday morning. He admitted that he drank, smoked some marijuana, and did cocaine. Hey, man, wake up. Get up, man. He said he returned to the house he shared with Dan Grant at about 7 a.m., then left again at about 8.45 a.m. Meanwhile, FBI agent Diedrich's investigation into fiber and hair evidence was growing more complicated. Uh, one of the items that had come in uh, consisted of vacuum sweepings. At least there were several vacuum sweepings from different rooms. Those items have to be processed and hairs have to be prepared from that. What was, I think, probably the most difficult aspect of this case for me was in trying to account for every hair that was found in that residence. And that's something that's not usually done and, and uh, seen as there, there are often too many hairs to deal with. Um, but in this case, it was, it was a monumental task to do that. Each hair displays its own peculiar characteristics under a microscope, making it possible to trace its likely origin. 
the fact that hairs will differ from person to person is, is very evident when you magnify these characteristics upwards of 250, 400 times. To examine the fibers and hairs collected at the scene, Diedrich used two high-powered comparison microscopes connected by an optical bridge, one for known material and the other for material yet to be identified. Because Anthony had lived with the Newmans for a while, his hair was likely to be in the apartment. That meant it was important to establish whether the trace hairs were old or recent. So Diedrich went through the contents of the vacuum used in the Newman household. Because of the vast quantities of hairs and other items that were found in the bag, uh, I had to look at the vacuum bag from a layer standpoint. That is, what was the most recently deposited or recently vacuumed material? Since Kirby Anthony had denied being in the Newman's apartment recently, it was imperative that Diedrich determine the condition of the hairs. The condition of the surface of hairs, uh, the condition of the ends, the roots uh, will often indicate how long a hair may have been in a particular environment. Working his way through the layers of the Newman's vacuum bag, Diedrich found some of the same types of hairs that did not appear to belong to any of the Newman's. These hairs had been recently deposited. In addition to the vacuum sweepings, unidentified pubic hairs were also found on the victims and inside their bedrooms. To determine the significance of these findings, Diedrich now wanted to know how hairs usually are transferred from one room to another. So he conducted his own experiment. Uh, it was a question as to how likely would it be to find somebody's hairs, say, say pubic hairs, in different areas of a home. So I designed a, a little experiment where I took uh, a, a vacuum home, crime scene vacuum to my house and vacuumed four bedrooms over a two week period, same time every day, just to see what types of hairs might be found. I was focusing mainly on pubic hairs. Diedrich preserved the material from every sweeping. He then compared the hairs from those sweepings with known hairs from himself. Diedrich was able to conclude that the hairs did migrate from room to room, mostly by sticking to socks or other clothing. The hairs deposited at the beginning of the experiment were deeper in the vacuum debris and therefore more damaged. The more recently deposited ones were not. The finding was significant to Diedrich. Since Cheryl told police that Nancy vacuumed her house Friday, the unidentified hairs found on the victims would have been deposited right at the time of the murders. Under microscopic scrutiny, an important piece of evidence was revealed. A pubic hair with a partial egg casing, the kind associated with genital lice, was clinging to the damp washcloth found in the Newman's bathroom. Diedrich told investigators of his findings and waited for a sample from a suspect in order to make a comparison. There were at least a half a dozen individuals who were considered prime suspects. Investigators received lists from the State Corrections Department of people recently released who had a history of sex crimes or violence. Some of them were living in the area close to the Newmans. To eliminate these individuals as suspects, each one was extensively questioned and all of their alibis were checked out. Police continued to question Anthony. He admitted nothing. But with each interview, the details of where he was and what he did the morning of the murders changed slightly. That was a, uh, kind of a, uh, an indicator of what we were going to be dealing with with Kirby from the get-go, was these little lies that weren't necessary but were thrown out to us. 
suite, so just walk in. Unaware of Diedrich's hair analysis, Anthony was asked by investigators to submit hair and blood samples. Wanting to appear cooperative, he voluntarily submitted the samples. They were rushed to Diedrich for comparison. The next day, Diedrich notified investigators that Anthony had pubic lice. Well, that was probably the most significant breakthrough. Uh, at that point, we could start focusing on Kirby as the suspect. When confronted with the evidence of the hair and egg casing on the washcloth, Anthony admitted that he did have lice. He said he had showered at the Newmans a week before the murders so as not to spread the pubic lice at Dan Grant's house. For Judd Ray, the dirty washcloth left at the crime scene told much about the suspect. The killer had cleaned himself at the murder scene. Why take the risk? Why not go home? It was obvious to me that he had to, that he had to go somewhere where he, where, where he couldn't go there all bloody, uh, 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 which sort of got into, this guy's not a loner living, living alone somewhere. Ray's behavioral profile also predicted the killer would have been associated with a previous sexual assault. This prediction prompted investigators to look deeper into Kirby's past. They learned that Kirby Anthony had been the central suspect in an Idaho case that remains open to this day. The victim, a 12-year-old girl, suffered brain damage in the attack and was unable to testify. He had... Uh just previous to coming to Alaska, uh, been the focus of police attention down there. They had a uh, some type of uh, outdoor picnic outing, and uh, there was a 12-year-old that was found in the woods. She had been strangled, unconscious, uh, near death, uh, and she had been sexually assaulted. Uh, their investigation uh, pointed right at Kirby Anthony. Ray also predicted the killer would want to appear cooperative with police. <laughs> They told us that the suspect would, would interject himself into the investigation. Uh, he would call to find out what the evidence was showing, and Kirby started doing that. What investigators did not share with Anthony was that Diedrich's other hair comparisons were also pointing to Anthony. The pubic hair found on the washcloth was only one of many positive associations Diedrich was able to make between hairs found at the crime scene and those submitted by Anthony. And in this case, uh, a number of pubic hairs that were like Kirby Anthony's were found in, in the rooms, both uh, the victim's rooms, the two girls, and as well as a couple of them that were similar to his on the bed of the mother. A hair from Anthony's head also was found on the top sheet of Nancy Newman's bed. Facial hairs that matched Anthony's beard were found on all of the victims and in their rooms. The vacuum sweepings from Melissa's room contained nine of Anthony's pubic hairs. The sweepings from Angie's room included two pubic hairs, one with blood and one with lice casings. Investigators felt it was time to keep tabs on Anthony's movements. Through surveillance, investigators learned of Anthony's hangouts and discreetly followed him around town. They hoped that Anthony would reveal something to his friends that would further implicate him in the murders. If he did, the investigators would soon find out. The effort paid off. One of Anthony's acquaintances told investigators that he was writing poetry on napkins and passing the poems around the table. He told one of the women that Nancy Newman had been forced to watch part of the assault. Investigators also learned that at one point after the murders, Anthony called his ex-girlfriend's mother in Idaho to tell her about the crime. Angie Newman had been stabbed, he said, and Nancy and Melissa sexually assaulted. Can I have someone to 
In both instances, the call to Idaho and the scene at the bar, Anthony could not yet have known about the details he described. He must have read a different article. The information had not been released by police to the press, nor had investigators mentioned it to Anthony during questioning. Since the surveillance was not a 24-hour-a-day tactic, they would often drive by his house to see if his vehicle was parked out front. If he was home, investigators would often ask him to answer some questions. The circumstantial evidence against Anthony was mounting. During a visit to his residence, investigators noticed a manually operated camera belonging to John Newman that had been reported missing after the murders. He told detectives that the Newmans lent it to him, but when asked later to demonstrate how it worked, he seemed to have no idea how to operate it. Another item missing from the Newman house seemed to be traceable to Anthony. The tip money missing from the cookie tin consisted only of coins. Three of Anthony's friends told police they either saw him rolling coins into wrappers or saw him pay for items with wrapped coins. And then there were the prints. Anthony's palm print was found on the wall over the bed where Melissa Newman had been assaulted. Prints found on the empty cookie tin on the kitchen table matched Anthony's. His prints were also found on the living room closet door and the inside and outside of the apartment door. Another place we located one of uh, Kirby's fingerprints was on the back side of the door to the mother's bedroom. And again, its, its position was significant in that it uh, led us to believe that perhaps uh, someone was trying to escape out of the room and he already had some other trace evidence on his hand, he slammed the door shut, uh, transferring not only his fingerprint but some of the other trace evidence that was found in the scene. The evidence was overwhelming. Every suspect in the month-long investigation had ultimately been cleared, except Kirby Anthony. Appreciate that. What, well, when you got home, was there anyone there? For um, investigators, it was somewhere. time to obtain an arrest warrant. And when you got home? Judd Ray had previously cautioned investigators that the killer might try to flee if the pressure became too much. The increasing intensity of police questioning had made Anthony nervous. Judd Ray was right again. Anthony confided to his roommate, Dan Grant, that he was leaving town. He asked his friend not to tell police. Grant was afraid to contact Anchorage police because of Anthony's notorious temper. Second precinct test. Nonetheless, he did finally call them seven hours later. Okay. Anthony was heading to the Canadian border, an eight-hour drive away, and he had a seven-hour head start. Anchorage and the Canadian border are separated by hundreds of miles of uninhabited wilderness. Anthony could be hiding anywhere. Anchorage police quickly contacted U.S. Customs at the Alaska-Canada border. They described Anthony in his vehicle and told the custom official that Anthony was a suspect in a triple homicide. They were hoping he was on his way. Less than an hour later, Anthony arrived at U.S. Customs. Having no idea that investigators had been tipped off, Anthony calmly pulled up to the Customs gate. Step out of the car. Could you get out of the car, please? He was detained and questioned until Alaska State Troopers arrived. 
He was arrested for driving on a suspended license and returned to Anchorage. Thanks a lot for the hospitality there. As he was turned over to the Anchorage police, he was read his rights and charged. Three counts first degree murder, two counts sexual assault, and one count kidnapping. Under Alaska law, kidnapping can be charged if a victim is restrained during an assault. Melissa Newman had been tied up during the attack. He jumps up and screaming, what is this kidnapping stuff? Uh, which struck us as odd because uh, here he was charged with three counts of murder and, and two counts of uh, sexual assault and, uh, and he's screaming about the kidnapping charge. By this time, the forensic evidence was complete enough that police believed they could reconstruct how Angie, Melissa and Nancy were brutally murdered. The last time Cheryl Chapman saw her sister alive was Friday, March 13th. Cheryl, Paul, and Nancy had each arrived separately at the restaurant where Nancy worked to meet for drinks. Cheryl's daughter, Kelly, had taken Nancy's girls swimming, so the adults had a night out. Paul Chapman had to leave the restaurant early to pick up his son, but planned to meet them later at Nancy's apartment. As they were leaving, Cheryl suggested that Nancy leave her car at the restaurant and ride home with her. Nancy had Saturday off, and Paul would gladly give her a ride back to her car tomorrow. I don't know. I never pay attention. You're in, what, 1130? Yeah. What time are you coming in? Uh, 11. Yeah. Cheryl, Paul, and Nancy all ended up at the Newman's apartment to wait for Kelly and the girls. They sat laughing and talking until about 9.45 when the girls came home. Kelly had treated them to hamburgers. At about 10 p.m., Cheryl and Paul were ready to leave. Cheryl helped Nancy clear the table and put the used coffee mugs in the sink. Angie was already in her pajamas, and Melissa had gone to her room to get ready for bed. As they said goodnight, Paul told Nancy to call him the next day if she wanted a ride back to her car. Sometime between 7 a.m. and noon on Saturday, March 14th, Kirby Anthony arrived at the Newman's apartment. Kirby Anthony is the only person who knows what happened next. Perhaps Nancy refused to lend him money. Perhaps she refused a sexual advance. Perhaps she ordered him out of the apartment. In any case, his anger boiled over. <laughs> Evidence indicated that part of the assault on Melissa occurred in her mother's room. Both would have had to have been restrained, and their bodies did show signs of having been bound. We are able to show through serological findings that Melissa, the eight-year-old, had been assaulted in the mother's bedroom and that she had crossed the bed and was actively bleeding at the time. And then uh, she is subdued somehow and held in a position in that room for a period of time. Melissa Newman probably witnessed the rape and murder of her mother. She then was taken back to her bedroom where she was assaulted again and killed. The knife used to kill little Angie was 
never recovered. It was unclear whether she was killed first or last. What was certain was that she seemed to be the target of a horrible, uncontrolled rage. Nancy Newman did not call Paul Chapman the next day for a ride to her car, nor did she answer the phone when her sister tried to reach her repeatedly. Instead, she and her two daughters lay dead nearly a full day before their bodies were discovered. The particular grudge against Angie may have grown out of the few times that Anthony babysat the girls. Reportedly, he had called her a tyrant. But for those close to the victims, and for investigators working the case, nothing could explain Kirby Anthony's savagery. I don't really think that, that, that you could isolate any one thing that would cause a man to fly into the homicidal rage like Kirby Anthony did. Yeah, for the most part, uh, you know, I don't think that Kirby Anthony could even tell you why he would do something like that. A grieving John Newman sat in stony silence throughout his nephew's trial. After eight weeks of testimony, the jury reached a verdict on June 3, 1988. A clean-shaven Anthony seemed confident as he waited for the verdict. As each guilty verdict was read, Anthony's composure disintegrated until finally it shattered completely. He was sentenced to 357 years for his crimes. Kirby Anthony's conviction represented an almost textbook example of cooperative police work. Anchorage police provided the FBI with evidence collected from a meticulously preserved crime scene. Doug Diedrich carefully analyzed the hairs and fibers and anticipated Kirby Anthony's excuses, conducting his own home experiment to refute them. Judd Ray helped police stay several steps ahead of Anthony's thoughts and actions. And for the first time, testimony of an FBI profiler was accepted in court. It was a good case to test the waters in terms of uh, whether or not this was going to be accepted in, in our judicial system. And for that, the implications are probably uh, far-reaching uh, because it opened the door. 